Good morning, church family. Happy Sabbath. I hope that you are enjoying this Sabbath day that God has set aside for us to worship Him, uh, even to spend time together. Uh, although we're not able to be together in person, I'm glad that we're able to do that virtually, uh, although it's not quite as good as the real thing, but um, hopefully we will be together soon. And this morning I want to share with you a story from the book of Exodus. I've shared part of the story of Exodus um, in the recent past, and I want to continue uh, that story with you today, this morning. Uh, we're going to look at a story from the book of Exodus, chapter 32. And before we get into that story, I want to refresh you about what's been going on in the book of Exodus and catch you up to speed with what's happened. Um, in the beginning of the book of Exodus, God has seen the suffering of his people. I'm sure you're familiar with this story. He sees the slavery uh, that they are subject to, and he hears their cries for help. And so God intervenes then at the beginning of the book. He sends Moses uh, back into Egypt, and God delivers his people from their slavery in Egypt with uh, miracle after miracle, uh, showing his power over the Egyptians and over their false gods. And as he leads them out of Egypt, uh, he continues to provide for them over and over as they go into the desert. He parts the Red Sea for them to pass through. He protects them from the pursuing Egyptian armies as they come to uh, reclaim their lost slaves. As they continue on in the desert, God uh, miraculously provides water for them to drink. And he provides manna, this food that just appears on the ground every day for them to eat. Um, when an, the Amalekites send an army to attack them there in the desert, God miraculously protects them uh, from physical harm and provides victory for them. And he leads them then to Mount Sinai. And as the people gather at the foot of Mount Sinai, God speaks audibly to them. He speaks to them from the top of the mountain. He presents himself to them and he invites them into a covenant with him. And he shares with them the terms of the covenant. We know the Ten Commandments today, and there were other terms of the covenant as well. And, and as the people hear the Ten Commandments and, and all of the terms of this relationship that he calls them into, at the foot of the mountain, the Israelites said, All that the Lord has spoken, we will do. But when Moses then delayed a bit on the top of the mountain, spending time in God's presence, receiving the Ten Commandments written in God's hand on stone. The people turned back at that time in their hearts. They turned back to the false gods of Egypt and the things that they had known. And they compelled Aaron in Moses' absence to make an idol for them to worship, something that God had expressly forbidden them in the Ten Commandments. And God would have done away with them right then and there while Moses is on the top of the mountain with him, except that God had raised Moses up to intercede on behalf of the people. And when God told Moses what was going on down in the valley below, Moses spoke up for the people. And God relented from the disaster that he had spoken of bringing on his people. That's what it says in Exodus 32. And that's where we're going to pick up the story today with a people in the midst of rebellion and Moses there with God on the top of the mountain. So let's pray together as we open God's word. Father in heaven, we invite you to be with us here this morning as we worship you, as we gather together, united uh, in spite of the distance that separates us today. Lord, we ask for the outpouring of your Spirit into our lives and into our hearts, into our community and our world. And particularly now, we ask for wisdom and understanding as we open your word that you would speak to us through this message. In Jesus' name, amen. Moses and Joshua made their way along the dusty path. This whole uh, experience had really been surreal for the two of them. More than a month had elapsed and it seemed like only a couple of days. He should have been exhilarated and instead Moses looked exhausted. He looked stressed and, and troubled. 
Joshua could tell right away that something wasn't quite right. He had waited so patiently for his mentor to return to him. And now that Moses had come back, Joshua was eager to hear everything that had transpired and his experience there in God's presence. What did God say to him? And and what were they doing this whole time? And, And were there angels there? He had so many questions for Moses. But Moses' silence now was all the signal that Joshua needed to know that something was up, something wasn't right. Moses had hardly said five words to him since he had returned and told him, to go back down the mountain. Joshua, of course, noticed these stone tablets that Moses was carrying. They were inscribed with the words of the covenant Joshua knew, but Moses hadn't offered to let him look at them. In Exodus 32, verse 15, let's read that passage now. Exodus 32, verse 15, here's what God's word says. It says, Then Moses turned... And went down from the mountain with the two tablets of the testimony in his hand. Tablets that were written on both sides, on the front and on the back they were written. The tablets were the work of God and the writing was the writing of God engraved on the tablets. Moses oblivious to Joshua's curiosity and forgetful even of the stone tablets in his hand, was still processing this most recent revelation. While Moses had been with God there on the mountain, his people were waiting down in the valley below and they had broken the agreement that they had made. They had turned back in their hearts to the ways of Egypt. They had made an idol of gold and they had sacrificed to it and worshipped it. It was a gross rejection of the God who only a couple of months ago had provided for them by freeing them from slavery and and provided miracles to sustain them throughout the desert on their journey here to this mountain. Justice demanded that God put an end to his own people. And yet when Moses interceded for them, God's mercy won out and he spared their lives. Moses had been activated even in those moments of shock by a sincere and deep love for his people. Yes, they were stubborn, they were rebellious, they were cynical, they were ungrateful, but they were his people. They were God's people. Moses reflected on the difficulty of this situation. His people's sin had put God in a predicament. On the one hand, the law had been broken clearly and without question. And if God does nothing at that point, it's like there is no law. It's like his law is really just a suggestion. Sin of all kind will begin to run rampant in an environment like that. Misery will ensue when there's no real law at play. On the other hand, of course, God is merciful. That's his nature. And he loves his people. He doesn't want to destroy them. He wants to save them. And so he offers forgiveness without condoning or tolerating their rebellion. The law is upheld, and yet there is room for mercy. But still, though, of course, that's not the end of it. Those who have been forgiven must actually change their behavior in order for this idea to work. God doesn't want sin to grow unchecked among his people. He doesn't want adultery and the broken lives that then result from it. God doesn't want abuse to reign in every home. He doesn't want lying and murder and theft to cause misery to his people. These things and the pain that they cause, they're not okay. They have to change. So how can you just simply forgive people or look the other way and let these problems persist? But then, of course, there's this whole other part of this issue. The Israelites are God's people. They belong to him. They have been bound to him in a covenant, a legally binding 
contractual relationship. He is their God, and they are his people. And when they agreed to his covenant, God then made them priests, that is, intercessors to the rest of the world. Their whole purpose in having this relationship and the law that goes along with it that describes that relationship is so that they can then share about God and this God that they serve with the rest of the world. And as the Israelites prosper, other nations come to learn about their God and the law of love that he has given them, that has blessed them so much. God's work to save the whole world from sin is dependent on the nation that bears his name, faithfully representing him to the rest of the world. And now, how is that going to work? Moses held the two stone tablets that had been weighing on his arms. You shall have no other gods before me. You shall not make for yourself a carved image. You shall not bow down to them or serve them. How could the Israelites tell other nations not to do that now? Moses' breath went out in a sigh of defeat. How was he going to deal with this? How was he going to be able to face them? How could he get them to see what they had done? He looked again at the tablets. They had been given to him by God himself. They were inscribed by God's own finger. I am the Lord your God. Moses remembered the voice of God speaking those same words that were written there on these tablets. I am the Lord your God. The voice had been louder than the booming thunderclaps that had preceded it. It had been clearer than the bright tone of a trumpet. As his eyes scanned this inscription on the stone tablets, the voice rang out again in his memory. But this time, there was another sound. It was muffled. It was far off. What was that? Moses stopped. He turned. He, he looked at Joshua there on the trail who had also stopped to listen. Suddenly, Joshua's eyes went wide as well. Listen to what it says in verse 17 here in Exodus 32. It says, When Joshua heard the noise of the people as they shouted. He said to Moses, there is a noise of war in the camp. Moses listened again for the sound far distant. No, it, it wasn't war. There was a rhythmic pounding like the drums used in war, but this was not war. There was, there was a music there. There was, a, there was a wild commotion. To Joshua, it had sounded like the chaos of battle, or the panic of a surprise attack, but Moses knew exactly what it was. In verse 18, it says there, but he said, that is Moses said, it is not the sound of shouting for victory or the sound of the cry of defeat, but the sound of singing that I hear. Moses started forward again now, lips pursed now, more determined than ever. Minutes later, the camp appeared before them, a large crowd was gathered. They could see at the center of the camp. Some people were up on a raised platform there in the center, gesticulating wildly, surrounded by the others on the ground, dancing around and shouting and doing who knows what. Moses and Joshua proceeded along the path toward the outskirts of the camp. As they walked, surprised Israelites began to take notice of this pair coming toward them. And they began pointing and calling to the families and their neighbors to look and see that Moses and Joshua had returned. And as Moses and Joshua came then to the edge of the camp, they gained a clear view of this idolatrous festival happening amongst the Israelites. There were crowds of people dancing and shouting and singing. Some were lounging around the perimeter eating casually. Others were passed out 
here and there. Some were prostrating themselves in the direction of the platform where priests and musicians led with musical instruments and ceremonial garb in the worship of an idol prominently displayed on the top of a a pillar in the center, a golden bull calf. Moses had been told about what was happening down in the camp. But now, though, for the first time, he was seeing it and hearing it himself. He saw the people that he knew, those who had been with him through everything. Now, here, doing this. Not long ago, he had been consumed with mercy toward his fellow Israelites But now it was justice that filled his thoughts. Righteous outrage overcame him. Having just been in God's presence, this was too much for him. He couldn't stand it anymore. Stop this! Some of the Israelites had already been watching him, and now heads began to turn among the crowd of revelers. In verse 19, it says, And as soon as he came near the camp, and saw the calf and the dancing, Moses' anger burned hot, and he threw the tablets out of his hands and broke them at the foot of the mountain. The Israelites on the edge of camp looked on, stunned as Moses began marching into camp toward the pagan worshipers. Those nearer the festivities who had heard Moses yell and seen him throw down the tablets now began to scramble away in fear. Other worshippers now taking notice of this panic also saw Moses storming toward them and they too began to cower or slip away. One of the leaders on the platform audibly wondered at the people leaving just in time to see Moses barreling toward him. People were falling all over themselves to get out of Moses' way. The music had stopped. An awkward quiet had fallen over the scene. Moses ascended the platform. He reached out for the idol for a moment. He held it high over his head. He looked around at the faces of these interrupted worshipers as if to say, What have you done? And then he threw down the idol into one of the large fires there at the festival. In verse 20, Exodus chapter 32 tells us that he took the calf that they had made and burned it with fire and ground it to powder and scattered it on the water and made the people of Israel drink it. In his absence, the people had run wild. They had broken their covenant with God. They had returned to idol worship like all the Egyptians they they had just seen overthrown. How, after all that they had witnessed, could they go back to worshiping a worthless piece of jewelry? Moses' destruction of the tablets And the fragmented pieces that were left were a pointed and visual reminder of what they had done. And then by thoroughly annihilating this idol and making the people consume its powder, Moses had powerfully articulated the foolishness of thinking that an idol could do anything to help them. Some of the people had instigated this rebellion. Some had taken no part in it. But the majority had just been sucked along into it. And friends, that's the way that it usually goes. Sometimes we instigate sin. We get it started. Other times we take no part in the things that other people are doing. Many times we just get drawn into sin by those around us. We base our ideas of what is right and wrong on the things that other people do. And what we see other people doing shapes our idea of what's okay and of what's normal. And sometimes that leads us to think that sin maybe isn't really that big of a deal. Maybe there's nothing even wrong with it at all. Our ideas often become distorted 
and warped. But God wants us to see things as they truly are. And that means that we have to come face to face with the truth. And as a loving father who who wants us to be happy and he wants us to know peace, sometimes God has to arrest our attention. Sometimes he has to do it in a dramatic fashion. He has to interrupt us. God has to get us to see things differently. To acknowledge that that what we've been doing isn't okay. And to see it then for what it really is. Moses, full of righteous indignation in an emotional display of zeal that would foreshadow Jesus turning over of the tables in the temple centuries later, had interrupted the people's rebellious idolatry. And he had delivered an unforgettable, have your idol and eat it too, object lesson in the value of carved images. And now God's representative turned his attention to deal with the leadership who had let this happen. Notice what it says in verse 21. It says there, And Moses said to Aaron, What did this people do to you? that you have brought such a great sin upon them. Aaron, who had been left in the camp in Moses' place, who had had the opportunity to interrupt the people's idolatrous intentions before all of this had happened, and yet wanting to please them and to be thought well of, Aaron had quickly yielded to their demands when they confronted him. He had gone along with this tide of rebellion instead of standing up for what was right. And now Aaron was confronted with his actions. Notice what it says there in verse 22. It says, And Aaron said, Let not the anger of my Lord burn hot. You know the people, that they are set on evil. For they said to me, Make us gods who shall go before us. As for this Moses, the man who brought us up out of the land of Egypt, we do not know what has become of him. So I said to them, Let any who have gold take it off. So they gave it to me, and I threw it into the fire, and out came this calf. In the history of bad responses to being confronted with your sin, Aaron's response ranks up there as one of the worst. Like Adam and Eve, who pointed the finger of blame, and like Cain, who said, Am I my brother's keeper? Aaron was confronted with what he had done, and he royally blew it. Aaron made at least three mistakes that you and I can learn from and avoid. First of all, notice that Aaron said, Let not the anger of my Lord burn hot. You see, this wasn't so much an appeal for mercy from Moses as it was an attack against Moses for holding him accountable. Aaron was saying basically here, Don't overreact. Don't be unreasonable. Don't get all excited about this. And when you or I have the opportunity to be corrected, painful as that experience may be, let us not fall into the trap of attempting to avoid accountability by making that accountability seem unreasonable. Aaron's second mistake was to point the blame at others. You know these people. Come on, man. You know what they're like. What could I have done? They forced me. They would have killed me if I hadn't done it. They were upset. As for this Moses, they said, we don't know what's become of him. And Moses, you were gone so long. You never told us what was going on. You see, to anyone and to everyone, Aaron tried to point the blame. It was the people's fault. They made me do it. It was your fault, Moses. You didn't tell us what you were doing, that you were going to be gone so long. Friends, when you become confronted with your sin, beware of this mistake. Don't try to shift the blame to somebody else. Aaron's third mistake was to minimize and 
to lie about his sin. And boy, what a whopper that one was. I said to them, let any who have gold take it off. And so they gave it to me and I threw it into the fire and out came this calf. Aaron, of course, perhaps did not know that God had already told Moses what had happened. If he had, perhaps he wouldn't have tried to convince him that some miracle had taken place and that he had just harmlessly tossed the jewelry into the fire and it had made itself into this idol. But of course, beyond this audacious and bold-faced lie, Aaron also conveniently left out other details as well. Like, for instance, that he had taken the initiative to build an altar and had declared a festival to worship this idol. So often when we are confronted with our own wrongdoing, we want to minimize our guilt. And so we leave out details or we even lie about our involvement in whatever the matter is. And friends, all of this simply avoids the real work that needs to be done when we are confronted with our sin. God is giving us the opportunity to acknowledge it and to change our direction. Fortunately, Aaron's first response was not his last response. With Moses pleading, Aaron eventually came to see the truth of the situation. His attitude softened. He recognized his errors and his guilt, and he humbled his heart before God and repented. And many of the Israelites, in fact, did as well. But it was not easy for some of them to accept. As Moses and Aaron labored to bring the people then to repentance, it soon became apparent that some were stubbornly opposing these efforts. Some of the instigators of this whole thing, along with their supporters became more emboldened by this recent idolatry, and they didn't want to give it up. They'd harbored resentment toward Moses for interrupting their lives in Egypt, for destroying their idol, and for rebuking their sin. At the same time that Moses was working to restore people to God, this other group was digging in their heels. Moses had interceded on behalf of the people and God had mercifully withheld from destroying them. Moses had confronted them. He had interrupted their idolatry. He'd put an end to it. He had held Aaron accountable and he'd led him to repentance. But now this persistent disobedience threatened to divide this fledgling nation of freed slaves and solidify then a culture of neglect for the word of God. How could they be God's representatives if they didn't obey him or live like him? How could they ever impart to other nations what they didn't follow themselves? God's plan to reveal himself to the world and to save them from sin was already at risk. Moses grimaced at the thought of what to do. He could find no easy solution to this problem. Every choice only ended in pain and grieving. His heart ached and the dirt on his face was streaked. But finally, in the distress of his soul, he acknowledged that there was no way to avoid it. And then at God's direction, he rose and he went out to do what must be done. In verse 25... It says, And when Moses saw that the people had broken loose, for Aaron had let them break loose to the derision of their enemies, then Moses stood in the gate of the camp and said, Who is on the Lord's side? Come to me. And all the sons of Levi gathered around him. And he said to them, Thus says the Lord God of Israel, Put your sword on your side, each of you, and go to and from gate to gate throughout the camp, and each of you kill his brother and his companion and his neighbor. It was a terrible 
and solemn command. Go through the camp and put these rebels to death. Do not spare anyone on the basis of their standing or their relation. The command was not to put every person to death. A great number had already indicated their repentance. This command was directed only toward those who stubbornly persisted in this rebellion. But still, it was severe. It was uncompromising. To us, it may even seem cruel or harsh. But this was a response not simply to sin, but to persistent, unrepentant rebellion. It was a response not simply to idolatry, but to treason and rebellion. It was not just a matter of religious obedience, but of state security. But beyond that, a serious and uncompromising response was necessary in order to preserve Israel's purpose as God's people. It was necessary that there be a public record of the people's sin and the execution of punishment against those who persisted in it. This record would stand as a warning to future generations and a statement of how God looks on such actions. Without this documented response, the nation of Israel could never spread the knowledge of God and His law to their neighbors. Because what turns people off from your message more than hypocrisy? It's why people have lost faith in politicians today. It's why many in today's world have disdain for Christianity. It's why many of the young people who grew up in the church walk away from the faith in which they were raised. Why should I buy into this? You say one thing, but you do another. The walk has to match the talk. Some people in the Christian world today have bought into this backward idea about grace. You see, many of us have now so thoroughly thrown off the legalism and the self-righteous attitude of law-keeping from the former generations that we have gone astray. We've yanked the steering wheel too hard to the other side and we've nearly fallen in the ditch. Not that there can be such a thing as too much grace, but grace and forgiveness do not remove the consequences of sin. If you hit me in the face, I may forgive you for doing that, but my face is still going to hurt. You see, sin has consequences. It actually hurts people. It damages relationships. It causes heartache and suffering. And among those who profess to be God's people in particular, open and unprotested sin weakens our witness to the world. How many young people have left the church because the adults that they looked up to as models of what it means to be Christians acted in ways that were decidedly unchristian? And especially if that activity was well known and if it seemed to be accepted. How many postmoderns and millennials out there in the world today see Christians being judgmental and condemning and yet claim to worship a God who is loving? If there's one thing that will destroy our ability to fulfill the purpose for which we exist as a church, it is hypocrisy. And so, friends, how can we be both just and merciful? How can we love sinners but not accept the sin that they commit? How can we bring wayward souls to repentance and do it in love. And then, how should we respond to persistent rebellion? The approach of the early church and the method that Jesus taught us in Matthew chapter 18 is to first appeal to those who have sinned. Go to someone who is your friend and encourage them to be faithful. If they have sinned against you, offer forgiveness and seek reconciliation. Let the whole church work together, if it's necessary, to restore a person, to help them to be right with God. And if someone has publicly sinned, then let their repentance 
and their restoration be then equally public. But if a person persists stubbornly in rebellion, then treat them like anyone else who isn't a Christian. That is, love them and do all that you can to lead them to be reconciled to God. Friends, perhaps at times it may even be necessary for the church to publicly separate itself from someone as a testimony both to them and to everyone else that what they are doing, what they are engaged in persistently, we neither accept nor condone. And dealing with all of these matters is neither simple nor painless, but not dealing with them in the long run is less painless still. Let's go on in the story now in verse 28. Read along with me. It says, And the sons of Levi did according to the word of Moses. And that day about 3,000 men of the people fell. And Moses said, Today you have been ordained for the service of the Lord, each one at the cost of his son and of his brother, so that he might bestow a blessing upon you this day. The cost was indeed great that day. What was necessary had been done. God himself had ordered and directed the execution of this punishment. But God was not glad. He's never glad. Notice what he tells us in Ezekiel chapter 33, verse 11. God says, As I live, declares the Lord, I have no pleasure in the death of the wicked, but that the wicked turn from his way and live. God's appeal to Israel and to us is that we turn from our sin and live. Turn from our sin and accept the gift of life that he offers us because all of us have sinned. This isn't just for those people who have done some terrible thing. This is for all of us. In fact, this story is recorded specifically for us you and me today. It's recorded for those of us who live in the last day, awaiting Christ's return. The Apostle Paul talks about the Israelites coming out of Egypt. He talks about this experience that the Israelites are going through in this story, the things they've experienced and their rebellion in the wilderness. And he says about that experience in 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verses 6 and 7. He says, now these things took place as examples for us that we might not desire evil as they did, not be idolaters as some of them were, as it is written, the people sat down to eat and drink and rose up to play. The Apostle Paul talks about this story here, but he also talks about other instances of rebellion that took place later in the story, in the book of Numbers. And in 1 Corinthians chapter 10, beginning with verse 8, he says there, We must not indulge in sexual immorality as some of them did, and 23,000 fell in a single day. We must not put Christ to the test as some of them did and were destroyed by serpents, nor grumble as some of them did and were destroyed by the destroyer. Now these things happened to them as an example, but they were written down for our instruction on whom the end of the ages has come. These events were written down for our instruction on whom the end of the ages has come. We who are waiting for Christ's return, who anticipate the final separation of the saved from the lost, who know that God does not want sin to continue its ugly reign forever, who know that God will one day say, okay, enough is enough. I've saved all who will let me save them. Sin has gone on long enough. It is time to be done. This story of Israel's rebellion and its sad, heart-wrenching consequences 
looks forward expectantly to the day when God executes what is called his strange act, when he destroys both sin and all those who would throw themselves down into the fires of Mount Doom to have it. God loves us too much not to destroy it, not to put an end to sin. And so he calls to us, he calls to us to turn from it. You were led astray, but now he says, come back. He confronts us with the truth about our sins, and he promises us in 1 John chapter 1 and verse 9, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So church, I urge you today that if there is something in your heart that is not right, if there is anything that is separating you from God, now is the time that you know what that thing is. I don't know it. I'm not here to point anything out to you. But I encourage you to trust in the record of his love. The Israelites engaged in open rebellion, but those who turned back were accepted. Aaron's sin went on record, but he was restored. This is what God wants. He doesn't want you to be lost. He wants to restore you. He wants to be reconciled with you. Friends, trust in his love and his mercy. Come to him and faithfully wait for the fulfillment of his promises. Wait for that day when sin is done and when God's plan is finally complete. I want to close this morning with a passage from the book of Ezekiel, chapter 37. In Ezekiel 37, verse 23, looks forward to that final fulfillment of God's plan. And it says there, They shall not defile themselves any more with their idols and their detestable things or with any of their transgressions. But I will save them from all the backslidings in which they have sinned and will cleanse them, and they shall be my people, and I will be their God.